ask you for those of you if if you are already using canvas if you're not you can just check the chat and get some ideas um, tell us one thing that you like about canvas only if you are already using canvas what do you like about it grade book speed grader flexibility easy to use robust user-friendly um, students can work independently you don't need to have a specific due date yeah um, flexible different class settings external tools so I would agree with what all of you have said I, I have used Moodle as a facilitator for teachers um, I have used blackboard as a teacher I have taken courses in Moodle I have taken courses in canvas and I have taught with canvas I know in LA USD you schoolology if that's the correct pronunciation if anybody from LA can type in yes if I got that right and then um, a lot of schools adult ed like to use Edmodo there is there I think there are a couple others that are not coming to, to mind but one Google classroom and the argument of the teachers in my program for using Google classroom is because their kids are using Google Google classroom so I think that's wonderful um, my school has chosen like the majority of uh, community colleges in um, California have decided to use canvas so that is what's used when our adult students go on in their college and careers right so um, is there anything that's challenging only for those who view who do already use canvas what is challenging what's hard about canvas you think the quizzes and assignments are a bit hard okay creating quizzes oh, new students yeah Yes, building a course is very time consuming. I've been using Canvas for almost, I think, six years now. I have a ton of content in there, but that first, you know, semester or two really took a lot of time. I had all the content, you know, and I had a lot of electronic files, but getting it online can take up a lot of time and it can be stu uh, difficult for students who only have a phone. Pamela. Hi, Pamela. Yeah, so it's the, there is an app it's not perfect they can do a lot but not everything and when you are looking at a phone it's very small so you know if they're like me my eyes are getting so bad from looking at phones right is there anything that you would like to do or have students to be able to do in canvas that you you don't see how it can be done right now just becoming confident to do their assignments to do the work um, I'll tell you um, it was almost six year, years ago that I started teaching um, my ESL classes, advanced class, as hybrid. And I was so nervous. It was summer class. You know how students are in the summer, right? And it was at night. And there's the beach. My school is like walking distance to the beach. And I was thinking, this is going to be a disaster. Just first of all, the class, no one's going to show up. And second of all, I put all this work into putting everything in Canvas, and they're not going to come. Guess what? they came um, the first there was a little bit of pushback here and there because one student said why are we doing it like this and I, why do we have this part online and um, you know I showed her how she could use her phone she was using her phone only as a phone no one showed her that her phone is a powerful little computer by the end of the class she was posting on canvas she was like she had a hundred hours in canvas so it's you know just like anything the teacher is the motivator as well as the content and the connections between students that's what keeps students coming back okay so <clears throat> is there a best tool or best overall feature inside canvas that you or your students use so again for those of you who do use canvas conversation students uh, post videos in the discussion board yeah that is a very awesome tool you can link it with confer zoom Annie Gilbert I know your name very familiar name I don't think we've ever met in person discussions yes Pamela it logs the hours students don't know that <laughs> so it's kind of funny when when I do have a face-to-face -face class and I said look um, we're in week three you should have been in canvas already now because it's a hybrid class you know um, about nine hours and you were in there for 20 minutes like how do you know that yeah um, thank you yes um, someone mentioned the project idea um, this is 
out of Washington State. So maybe some of you know about the IBEST program, which is now called IET, right? It started in Washington State with a fund from the um, Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation project. Idea is taking that idea and get helping get, get students prepared. And you can import their whole entire course into your own Canvas course. Um, yes, so Canvas has great interface with different um, apps and programs. So thank you for all that information. It's being recorded here. So those of you who never use Canvas, come back and look at this recording once, it, once it's up and see what sort of things you might want to check out that, um, that you don't necessarily learn. Oh yeah, there's just so many tools. This is why I really love Canvas. There's just so much more that we can do, I feel, in my experience using Blackboard for many years. So here's here are the objectives for today. Again, I, I can't teach you Canvas in an hour, but you'll see some things that you could that will help you learn how to do this. And I have resources at the end to help you learn how to build your, your course. Um, so again, the the session focuses on what you do for a learning unit. Okay, so by the end of today's session, you will be able to discuss some features of online teaching in adult education in general, and to explain the value of using Canvas in particular. You'll be able to relate a way of organizing online activities in Canvas to mirror the best we can, what we're doing in an online environment, as to what we would do in our own classes. Of course, it will never be exactly the same, but the, the closer we get to creating connections between students and with students, the more that it's more, the, the more that it's like what we do in our actual classrooms face to face. Um, and that's what will keep students coming back to your course. Um, you should be able to explain a process for packaging online lesson activities into modules and even for those who've never used Canvas, hopefully you will walk away with one new idea you can adapt for using Canvas in your own teaching. Um, so I'm just gonna go through this really fast. Um, you know, this whole remote learning got thrown on us very fast. And for a long time in adult ed, we, we heard teachers and administrators say, no, students aren't ready for that. But you know, look, 91% have their cell phones, a smartphone, and this information comes from OTAN's um, tech survey. So you know that every agency that receives WIOA funds, 10% of the student enrollment have to take the survey. A lot more than 10 often do, a lot more than 10% of the enrollment. But you know, they are ready. They have their phones. The one, the one tough thing is that a lot of them um, do not have wired internet in their home, so they're using their phones and data to do our courses. So that's a little bit of a negative, but um, I've been following um, the CDE on LinkedIn, and it looks like they're coming up with digital equity plan, some way that all of our learners can have easy access to internet. If it's just driving up a, a van in a, in a, um, in maybe a housing community, and that would be one way for, for everybody to get Wi-Fi. So um, we're, you know, here in California, our adult ed is pretty cutting edge, and our students then are pretty innovative and pretty good with technology when you start to compare them with other states, let me tell you, okay? So 65% of our students already use technology to get information and 50%, 50%, this was fr from 2018, 19, 50% were already using technology to learn in class and 41% out of class. So they are ready. You know, not everyone has the access, but we're getting closer and closer. This 91, it, it was a lot lower a few years ago, and it just keeps creeping upward. So hopefully this could be the silver lining of this virus that our state will recognize that we need more digital equity and we'll roll out these plans that they're, they're discussing. Um, this is a little bit more information. I'm not going to go over everything, but you can just look, look over it and see what catches your eye. Our students are using their phones a lot to do research and in class. Those are the top two ways. Um, and you can see, yes, they're, they're doing a lot of entertainment, but they're using social media a whole lot already. And how do they communicate with their teacher? Well, I hate to say it, teachers, we're pretty much old school. A lot of them, me, I confess, yes. I still email my students, but I'm starting to use Remind. So I'm, you know, trying to, you know, do more texting while keeping, you know, my own cell phone number private and so on. But students are texting a lot. Um, 
and look at that though. Not many people, not many of our students are communicating with their teacher through an online course, but I, I can see that, you know, I would rather have my students email me directly than to send me an email through Canvas, you know, to be honest. Um, but there we see the numbers for the smartphones, okay? So why Canvas? Um, as I mentioned, there are something like, I don't know, there are more community colleges than listed here, but of about 113 have committed to using Canvas as their course management system. Um, just so that when, if a student starts at one community college, they go to another, it's not gonna be such a burden on them to have to learn an entire new LMS. Um, so it's, it's free. There is the Canvas that is free. And then if you're part of a community college, then you're getting the whole package, which is not a whole lot more, okay? But um, you can get this for free. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there's great tech support, I've heard. I've never used it myself, but it's open source. So you can take your course with you if you go to an if another job. It's easy migration. So I finished my class, you know, from this term and I want to repeat exactly the same next year at this time. I can just download and upload. It's super fast and easy. Um, there are assignments, quizzes, and other activities that are automatically linked to the gradebook. There's a mobile app for both students and teachers. It's, it's decent, but it's not the best. I just have to be honest there. You can set your notification preferences. There's chat and email built in. And there are many, many options for customization, navigation, entry points, profiles, and so on. Some of these things we're going to go over. And I've noticed, now I'm not sure if this is true on the free version, but you can award badges to students. Does anybody know what badges are? If you want to type in the chat what a badge is. And thank you for the person, Anthony, for um, putting the information about iBest in there. Anybody know what a badge is? So a badge is usually like some sort of little um, icon that um, you know we could gain as well, teachers, but um, that we can award students and they could put on their, you know, their social networking profile or whatever that shows, ooh, I finished a course using Canvas, okay, something like that. It's so easy to embed online um, content. I remember with Blackboard, I had to find the, the QR code for a video. I had to do like four steps or more. And in Canvas, if you've noticed, if I find a video on YouTube, I just put it into the area and it does automatic embedding for me, which is really nice. You can create groups, you, your discussion, don't have to be just text. They can include images, audio, video. You can see statistics of use of your students in the course. You can have a calendar for students if you set specific due dates for different assignments. And both you as instructor and students can have a to-do list. So when I, when I enter my courses in the top right corner you see there, I can see what things have been submitted and I need to grade. So um, I don't remember that with other I think it does exist in Moodle, but it's not, uh, it's not as easy because for Canvas, I can just click on there. It's going to take me straight to that student's submission. Um, students can see recently graded assignments. They can, um, you can comment on uploaded documents and assignments can have a rubric right there in Canvas. You can import, you can export, you can share your course, you can get course materials from Commons, Canvas Commons. Many of the, there are so many apps that can be integrated, um, including ConferZoom. And there's a student e-portfolio. And here's the nice thing, you know, we had to do this so fast, um, change this remote learning that, um, you know, students didn't get a textbook for my class. So I can, you know, the copyright law is like 10%, right? Um, but I can link to things outside of my course that I want them to read. And I'm not copyright, um, breaking copyright law by doing that. Um, this was um, an infographic I just saw on LinkedIn. Um, obviously, we missed out. We should have invested in Canvas and Zoom about two months ago. We would be very rich. Um, anyway, well, no, Canvas is open source, so it is free. Um, it does, it's not a corporation like um, Zoom necessarily, but look at the data. Wow, there's a lot going on online, definitely. Okay. So when you're creating a learning unit in any course, planning out in advance what will go in line is going to save you a lot of time and headaches, okay? So um, uh, I think it was in 2015. Um, I'm lucky, very lucky, and so um, 
so have so much gratitude for the fact that I do have a full-time tenured position. I wish every teacher in adult ed could, because what I got was um, a few months off for a sabbatical where I could focus on teach learning about teaching online. So I got my TESOL online teaching certification, and there's another one for community college faculty called at one. I did both of those and I felt like I was in grad school again. It was so much work, but I learned a lot. And so I know not everybody has that same opportunity. So that's why I'm here sharing what I learned in several months um, in a nutshell so that you don't have to pay for the coursework that I paid for. But what I learned is you need to have a production plan in advance okay and I'm not going to show you this one when you see the slides you can click on it and see how outlined I had to be so it reminds me of when I first started teaching when I was in graduate school we had to present a lesson plan because I'm you know a trained teacher actually so we had to present a lesson plan we had to turn in a written lesson plan and we had to write out every single little thing we were going to say and do well, of course, with more experience, I don't need to do that, right? Because as you know, as you get more experience in teaching, you, you can just have maybe a gen, an agenda and you have the lesson plan and what you're going to say and do in your head. So now when I'm working on, on building online materials, I don't do this necessarily. I do something a little bit more abbreviated, okay? But you can have a look at that because you need to plan in advance. If you were just building next week's content on Sunday night, you're going to be at the computer for many hours, okay? So consider how you will include an easy to understand welcoming homepage. Um, I've seen some, some different teachers homepage and it's just like, just, you know, nothing. There's just text there. You need to welcome students and there are lots of tools we can use to make this. You want consistency in each module. What I mean by module, from in my case, it's a week of work. For you, it depends on what you're teaching. It might be stretch over one week. You maybe will have a module that covers two weeks, but you want the look and feel and organization to be consistent. When you start doing that, it makes it a lot easier for students, okay? Um, you will want to figure out how you're going to do scaffolding to get to your end objective and build in a lot of recycling as well of course content because you maybe teach it in week one and when you get to teach uh, week seven you know it's not still there necessarily so you need to figure out how you're going to do that you want to make sure you have opportunities for student self-reflection um, that's research shows very important thing for students to be able to articulate to themselves what they learned and what they still need to do, right? And um, you want to make sure you have plenty of opportunities for you to give feedback to students, of course, but for students to give feedback to you. You want a variety of input. Um, so not necessarily, again, all text, you know, read this, read this, read this, you know, watching videos, look, look at this infographic, different content, um, and you want to present um, course content in more than one mode. That's what I'm meaning, different input, not just text. And you need to think about how you're going to assess students' learning. Because probably in, in our classes, we used classes tests, right? And we used maybe some quizzes that we made, and that's how we decided if the student should be promoted or not. Well, it looks different online, of course. So um, in this course that I had to take um, on um, testing, assessing students' work in an online environment, we had to do a similar plan. And so I had to take some of my typical classroom assessments, a variety of them, whether it's projects or whether it's just a multiple choice test, and figure out how it would work best online. And then the last thing you want to try to do is have some redundancy. So um, I'll, I'll show you an example of that little in a little while. But so, you know, for some of our students, first time to do online learning, we, we don't want them to have to be searching all over the page where to go next. So what we want is something that's very clear and easy to understand, and redundancy will help with that. Okay. So what I want to talk about first before we get into how to build a learning unit is, again, that welcome that you can give to students. So you see on the bottom left, that's called the tile. When students log in, and if they're <clears throat> taking more than one class, they may see multiple tiles. Well, the default for the tile is just a color. So can you imagine 
this this class that I had back in December, when they logged into Canvas, they saw their their classmates' face. And so that's kind of personalizing the content and welcoming them quite a bit. And then you can see on the right, I created a banner with a different class. So we were face to face with 25% hybrid. So, you know, that first week I went around with my phone and took pictures of everybody or I had them take pictures and send it to me in the computer lab. And this was the banner once they entered the course. So that is a way that you can welcome because otherwise it could be very sterile and boring and not inviting. So little things like this can make students want to log in and do the work. So these are two entry points. Um, so again, the tile is what that's called. You see, I have a um, screenshot from my dashboard. The current classes I'm teaching on top, my department has, um, a Canvas course where we share EL civics things and te uh, tech tips and teaching ideas and all of that. And then I'm on a college committee too. So my eye naturally goes to the college committee one because I miss, I miss my donuts so much. Okay, so the tile is your first entry point. You can see for my level seven class, it's a little bit stale, but it's been there since the beginning, so they know that that's that class, because they're taking three, four classes, some of them. Um, so it's what the students see. You need to make it memorable. How do you do that? Well, you can upload an image. Um, so I would recommend a copyright free um, stock photo site like Pixabay. You know, you don't have to pay for those photos unless it's one at the very top. You have to pay for those, but there are lots of great photos there. Maybe take a photo um, or you could create a tile with Canva. Notice that doesn't have an S. There's Canvas, this learning management system, and there's Canva, which we're going to look at in a minute. But how you get your tile set is you log into your course, you click on the tile that's there to get to the course, and you, far, number one, way at the bottom, of your left navigation is settings. Then you go to the top tab, course details, and then you click on the little um, three uh, vertical circles and you can upload an image, okay? So I've done this um, with just images. As you saw, I, I put students' pictures or Canva is just so beautiful. I love this site. Okay, well Canva, I got this email from Canva because I, I set up an account once to have students do a project to create their own infographic. And they sent me this email and um, evidently it says, Canva is supporting teachers, parents, and students when it comes to adapting student learning. They have thousands of free templates and resources that you can use to plan lessons and keep students engaged and empowered. Um, so let me just show you, you can see on the far right, these are some of their templates. I'm just going to go there so that you can see it for a second. I mean, this site is amazing. You can see I created some different things here, but you can create customized, beautiful templates for social media, posters, presentations, infographics, Facebook covers. So this is where you could create a banner or a tile for your course. There's just so much here. So all you do is you just, you just select the one style that you like and you change the words and you can add other photos. Um, it's free. There are just some beautiful pictures that you do need to pay for. So you, if you pay for the full subscription, it, it unlocks everything. But I, if I've, I never pay for anything very cheap. So. so what you could do with Canva is you could create your personal brand. You could create a brand for you and your teaching career the rest of your life. Um, so whenever you're showing a PowerPoint slideshow or a Google Slides, or maybe you create a handout or you have your online course, you could have similar design all the time. And when a student or a colleague picks up, they, oh, I know that's, that's Barbara. That's her brand. <laughs> so I don't work for Canva or anything like that. I just think it's a cool site. Lots of beautiful templates there. So with that, once you... You make sure that you just entering the course is a welcoming, um, a warm hand, right, to bring in the students. Then you need to also think about your front page. A front page is a home page. Um, in Canvas, what you, um, what you do is when you create a page, you select that one as your front page, the one that you want 
students to see first. Now I've seen some front pages that were just text and you can see mine, it's a lot of text, but I use some, I leave some white space, okay? But I tried to keep with my theme by having that banner at the top. So you can create a banner in Canva or you can create a banner with PowerPoint. And I'm not gonna go step by step for, uh, for you, but you can look at these slides later and you can test it out. You can email me if you have problems. But in PowerPoint, you go to the design tab and far on the right, there's a custom slide size and you choose banner. And then you can use any, any of those beautiful designs that PowerPoint has. And you could put your name, you could put your picture in it, and then you save it not as a PowerPoint, but as a JPEG, an image file. And so as you saw before, then you just go to your settings and you upload that image. Now, here's my, um, my home page, my front page. Um, I have right there in the front, frequently asked questions you know, for our students, okay? I have optional, join the Remind class. Um, so I can text them, you know, and, I, and they can text me. And then I have the link to our Zoom meeting. It's always the same. I made it as a recurring meeting, okay? And then, you know, little instructions. Start with the week below or select modules. So on the left, I cut it out, but the modules is in the navigation. And so they, there's never any where do I go because look how big I made that, week three, click there. And so I start with week zero and I go up, and then really I usually only have maximum three weeks listed. Because if, if we're already like in week three and they didn't do week zero, then just skip it, just forget it, right? So um, I've seen teachers do it different ways. I've seen teachers at my college who um, teach online and they put the whole course, 16 weeks, visible. And for me, I think if I were a student, I think that I would be really intimidated. I know there are some of you, and I know you, Donna, and some of you folks here today, that you're, you like to get things done. When you see, I need to do all this, I'm going to get it done right now. And so I think you want to keep things hidden. You know, so if you've got something planned for next week or the following week, keep it hidden. And it's really easy to do. Okay, and one thing I'll mention, um, I'm not a web designer or anything like that, but you know when you want to have, if, where you see my little class information, to get the alignment like that is when you go in to create your page, you'll want to use a table, and then things will stay aligned like that. And then you can see at the bottom, I include a pinned discussion. So I'm going to talk about discussion forums in a minute, but there's one right there that's just, it's like what we call the parking lot sometimes. It's just questions about anything. I don't care about the class, about the weather, um, you know, you know, order, order out, delivery, food, recommendations, okay? And then there's an orientation to Canvas. So this is what they see every single time, and they know right there to look at the week number, and that's where they're going to go. The current week number is always on top. Um, my colleague, she's much more creative than I am, and she teaches a lower level, ESL. So she created her little avatar on Bitmoji, and she uses Bunsy. I don't know if anyone here was able to see her presentation last Friday. Um, I wasn't able to. I really wanted to because Bunsy, look at the design. It, it reminds me of Canva, but it can do even more. So working with her audience, she creates this really cute welcome right there. And you can check out her slides on the OTAN COVID resources website. Okay. Another view, okay, because I know there are some of you who teach maybe beginning level ESL. And so this is one of my colleagues. She shared with me a, a short recording of her homepage. So she used it a very graphical design. And then she has week one only. And she did list, list all of her weeks. But what I really like is, I better not show her um, Zoom ID. Okay, there. What I really like is that um, she um, started with the current week at top. Because we don't want them to you know, have to go down to the bottom for the current week. So when you're creating um, your banners or any course content on Canvas, there's something called the student view, which I'll show you in a little bit. And I would really recommend looking at it on a phone, looking at it on a tablet, looking on it, at it on the app, 
and also in a web browser on a computer because you know sometimes I've put in things and it looks fine on my very large computer screen and when I look at it on a phone it's either a really small font or just it got all cut off and it looks weird the alignment is off so check it a few times and in canvas there's a student view to see what make sure that you have the right things hidden that you don't want students to see is you can see exactly what a student would see and as i said consider your audience so if you're teaching low-level esl pictures and things like that graphics if you're teaching something like chemistry well you probably maybe you'll include some cool um uh, icon or something but it, you probably will have a bit more text-based um, so then going to the nav navigation, before we started today, I asked Melinda, because she's an expert, and I'm not an expert on this, but I have been told before that not to have too many things on your navigation. So the navigation on Canvas is always on the left side, and by default, there are several there. But if you can imagine your student going into Canvas for the first time and see all of these navigation points, I don't even know where to start. Maybe home, I guess. I don't know. So um, the right number is six. Repeat after me. Six. Six on the navigation. Okay. So six is reasonable. I think I have a few more because one of mine is Net Tutor. That's to our tutoring ser service. And I kind of like Name Coach. But anyway, I'll explain a little bit more about those. But what you can do is you go to your settings in your navigation. You go up to the navigation tab and you see the ones that are top, they will show for students. If there's something here you don't want, like I don't want them to chat, then I can click on that and I just drag it down to the disabled items and save. If there's something down here, maybe I want confer zoom up here, I can just click on it, drag it up and save. So you have that option to modify your navigation, like most link, uh, learning management systems do. Okay, one thing that Canvas does is it puts announcements that you send above your banner and your home page. So, you know, I, I do email my students oh, uh, like two times a day right now. Um, no one's complained yet, but I, I just want to, I don't want them to walk away from my class and try so hard. I have like 100% persistent so far so I'm gonna keep that but if if I have this set as you know putting all of the announcements there they're not gonna see what they need to do until they scroll really far down so you can control the number of announcements that are posted on your home page you go to settings in the bottom of your navigation course details and there's a tiny little part way at the bottom it's just some words that say more options if you click that then you can say I want just one announcement the most recent announcements I want two. I set it for three you know so they can see yesterday and the two I sent today or something and last thing about entry points and navigation so this shows you what I was just mentioning about where you find that thing in the in the course details and then in the settings more options and then you can see you can you can set lots of different things here for the home page so how many announcements let students attach files to discussions those are some other settings in here as well that you want to check out and going back to the personalization oh my gosh it's so important for you to put your picture there and for your students to put their picture there so i always it's one of the first things that i have students do is have them create their um, profile so this was a few years back when i was teaching um vessel career track and this was my student sandra i cut off her last name i don't think she, she doesn't mind if i told you her information she worked for coca-cola company and you can see she was in a couple different classes so her profile will follow her um, when she's using Canvas at our course. And then they can put their social media. And I set my pro profile too. So you just, when you log in, um, you're gonna go to the little blue box on the left and you're gonna go to profile, you upload a picture, you can put your social media um, links, you can you know, give a little information about yourself. This is really nice because then students can learn a little bit be, uh, about you before they even join your class. And then you see here, my badges and then there's something don't think this is on free version name coach recorder 
I love that. I'm going to show you that when we get a little bit later, but you know, even if we're not meeting our students face to face, I would like to know how to pronounce their name and I would like them to know how to pronounce my name. So when you come back to here, these slides, if you click right here, it will show you step by step how to create a profile and you can share that with your students. I have some students who really resist to put their own picture, but that's fine. You know, they, if they want to put in a rose bush, I'm fine with that. But you know, it is, it is better when you're doing a discussion session board to be able to see the other person's face that you're writing to, right? And okay, so now we're going to go to the organization of a learning unit within Canvas. Um, so you want to probably either keep on the left navigation the syllabus, and what I do is I just upload the PDF file, and any file that is uploaded it looks like this. They don't have to download it unless they want to. It's kind of just embedded and scrollable within the page. So you can use files to upload any kind of documents, images, even, even videos. And a file can be added to a module alone and it's automatically embedded like this. But you could also put it as a link in a page. So we create pages to deliver content, okay? So there are many different things within Canvas. There are external links. I saw someone mention that in the text. So um, they don't see the ugly URL that's like 25 letters long or whatever. They just see the name of the site, okay? You can use assignments for graded tasks, but they can be ungraded tasks too. And you use quizzes to assess. Quizzes and assignments are automatically linked to the gradebook. But you can, you can choose to have a quiz be a practice quiz, and it's not included in the grades. So as you see here, when you create a quiz, practice quiz. You can create a survey or ungraded survey. You can shuffle the answers. You can have a time limit, which I never do. Allow multiple attempts, I always do that. I read this book um, that I really enjoy, and I always tell any teacher I can about it. And where is it? I'm looking for it on my belt bookshelf. Um, it's... Um, how to deliver lessons so that students, you know, remember our, our content. I'm going to um, think of the title and let you know before we go. But it said that basically we should let students take multiple attempts at a quiz. Why? If they take it once and they get 60% and that's it, do you think they're really going to go back and study those, you know, questions they got wrong? Only the most conscientious and motivated students will, right? So they will, if we don't give them another chance, they're gonna remember 40% of the content incorrectly. So I always allow multiple attempts, attempts and then um, the, the quiz score that stays is the one that they did the best on, the highest score. You can have students see their um, quiz responses or not. Um, you can let them see the correct answers. You can have one question at a time. You can require an access code, which I never do because I teach non-credit, you know, um, and so on. So this one, filter IP addresses, I think that's to make sure that um, they're not having someone else take the quiz for them or something. Okay, a learning unit. What is a learning unit? Think Wikia. I know some of you are teacher trainers there in our, in our group today. If you can type in the chat, what does W stand for? Warm up or review, because sometimes a lesson goes over several days or, or something like that, or you, you maybe you do a little formative assessment, like, oh no, <laughs> we need to review and I need to teach this all over again. I is, introduction. P is presentation. P, the other P is practice. I think, I think that that is a weakness I admit of myself, but probably a lot of us that we, we spend a lot of time, you know, setting up the content and getting them the background knowledge, but then we don't give them enough practice. So there's got to be more than just one practice activity. It has to be multiple different types of practice activities. Um, and E, evaluation, and A, application. And so the way that we should create a unit is thinking again, Bloom's taxonomy or Webb's depth of knowledge, this has been around for a long time. What do we want students to do at the end? 
What do we want them to produce at the end? Same as with a lesson plan. What do we want them to be able to do with this information that we gave them? So both of these follow a backwards design, lesson planning and thinking of Bloom's taxonomy as well, and building a learning unit online. We want to st start with the end first. What is the objective? What is the desired outcome? What do you want students to be able to do with what you are teaching them? And so we start there and then we go backwards. Okay, what am I gonna do for a warm up? Okay, how about if I use a picture? Uh, what, what, how am I going to introduce this? Maybe I'll have a video. Okay, and then um, how am I, so you need to start thinking of what you could do online for each of these building backwards. You like my animation? I like it, okay. So I kind of brainstormed and I thought, what, what could you do for a warm up or review? Um, a warm up or review is an activity to review previously learned content or to focus on the new topic. Okay, introduction to focus their intention, their attention and to help them understand why you're teaching this and you need to re relate it to their needs, goals and lives. And um, you are trying to see by introducing if they know anything about it. Maybe if they don't know anything about it, maybe you need to, you know, expand out, scale out your lesson more. Presentation, you're introducing the new content. A lot of us still, I, I still use PowerPoint or I make now online, I make a video right? So that's where I'm introducing the new con, um, content. And video is great, but it's not for everyone. So you, when you can, this is called universal de design, when you can present the information in more than one mode, more than one way, because we know some people are readers. Some people want to see a picture. Some people need to move. Some people need another thing like they need to hear it okay so um when you can either in the presentation or in the practice or the value you know include more than one type of input um so practice is where we do the um i do we do you do so modeling activities monitoring students providing feedback evaluation is we're testing to see if they got it or not and we should include in the evaluation a, a chance for students to reflect on their learning. And application is really what, where are they going to use this out in the world? Where are they going to, how is this going to help them, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives? How can they transfer this new knowledge to a new situation? So does anybody want to say what you do for a warm-up? Um, I'm going to skip this and just show you that, again, a warm-up review could be a video, an image, a question prompt. Um, to answer in a discussion, a Zoom meeting, a poll, conversation groups in a Zoom meeting. Um, introduction, again, could be a video, a text, content on a page, a file, external link, presentation could be. A, so there's, you know, some overlap of what you could use. Um, you could create a video. You could make a narrated see, we slide. Also have, we also have mm -hmm. vocabulary, uh, Kahoot, and um, reviewing uh, with uh, using a positive quote related to life. Oh, I love that. Nice. So Kahoot could be used in the beginning to assess what they know. And then you could do Kahoot or some other, you know, fun quizzing um, site to find out if they did better. <laughs> Hopefully they did. Discussion forums. Um, I was talking to Melinda and I think anybody here, if you've ever taken an online course, there is no online course in this world that doesn't have a discussion forum. It's always there. The great thing with Canvas is there are multiple ways you can you can participate. It doesn't only have to be writing. Um, so assignment could be a practice, an ungraded quiz, external links, group activities. Evaluation is typically a quiz or an assignment, maybe a project or to write something. And the application, well, we can't always see how students, we, we have in our minds how, what they're going to do with this outside in their real lives. But um, maybe it could be that they reflect and they tell you how they're going to use this this information that you've taught them so this is this is my process first thing i do is i make the modules all a module is it's like it's like a cardboard box that holds all of your content or an envelope that holds there's nothing much there it's just an organization tool then i then i create my module entry page so that's kind of like the front cover of the envelope where I have an overview of the module, what, what we're going to study this week. Maybe you could have the objectives for the week. Maybe you could link to each item that they're going to do 
um, in that first opening page. That's what I call my warm up or introduction. Um, then the, the content can be pages, files, discussions, assignments, quizzes, external resources. These are the presentation practice and evaluation pieces of the learning unit. And then sometimes I give extra. You know, like I notice, oh, there's some students who they, they need a little something more about this specific skill. Not everybody needs it. So I usually have a section header with more practice for those. I have some very motivated students and they want more and more and more. Not everybody does, but they do. So I have that kind of separate so that they can do that. And then what I like to include is a module exit page, something that they um, can click on, a Google form or something to reflect themselves, maybe to take a quiz or to tell me how they think they have done so far. They can tell me, but really that is for them to see what they need to do better in the class, okay? So that's my process. And so to create a learning unit, um, the first thing I do is create those modules. Left navigation, you click modules. Then you see this number two, you click on the blue plus, that's on the right, module. And then you type a module name. I usually, I often call it like week one, week two, week three. Um, or sometimes it's a specific theme that I may get, but most likely, most usually I use uh, the week number. And you can lock it until a certain date. And you can add a prerequisite. In other words, you can add that they cannot come into module or week two until they finish certain things in week one. So it's kind of releasing content. I don't do that, honestly, but it, it, you could do that, okay? Um, so to create a learning unit with modules, you can see I have here, here's my name, week six, geography, wonders of the world. And here's where I set prerequisites and requirements. Okay, so prerequisite, something they have to do before they can see this content, and requirement, students must complete all of these requirements that they move through a sequential order. So th that might be true in your, in your teaching that you're going very scaffolded, that they couldn't jump to the third activity until they really spend more time with the second activity. So you have the option of locking that. What I've been doing is releasing day by day, okay, in my modules. I'll show that in a little bit. Okay, the default for Canvas and probably a lot of learning management systems, um, when they go in to see their modules, um, and I used to do this as we see on the left, is the first module you create and make open to students is at the top. Then the next week is, goes under that, and the next week under that. But I, I figured out that is not the best way because then there's a lot of scrolling to get to week two and three and four. So how I create my modules is once I put them in, I, these are just the modules, they're just titles of what um, each week is going to be about. I put them in uh, the opposite order. I don't know how else to call it. So that the first weeks are at the bottom and the current week is at the top. So they don't have to scroll as they would on the left. Okay, so that's how I, one, one little recommendation. You can try it, see how you like it. Okay, so learning pages are basically um, assignments and background information and reading and videos and things like that. Okay, so once you go to create assignment, this look is very similar for, for assignments and for discussions, and um, it looks quite the same. Announcements look like this too. So of course you put the subject area here. You can do all kinds of different formatting, and here's the table. So if you wanted things aligned, um, you see there's, um, there's video, media that you can put, hyperlinks, the hyperlink's no good, you wanna change it. Um, an image, usually with images, you have to paste in the URL, if you found it somewhere online, or upload it, and then go to your images and, and insert it. Um, however, in the discussion board, I was surprised because um, in the discussion, if you find an image online, you can do the right-click, copy, right-click, paste. So um, that does work. I don't know this thing, something about math. <laughs> 
And um, there are some things here that I'll explain in a little bit. So what's really nice when you create a page, I never even noticed this before um, a couple days ago. There's this little box down there that you can add this page to the student to do. So when they log in, they're going to see on the right page all their, like a to-do list. And if you change anything, you can notify users. So um, what some teachers do and what I do sometimes is I use Google Slideshow or a Google Doc because I want them to be able to go there and make changes on it, okay, or something. You can embed a Google Doc here. You can embed um, a Google Slideshow. These directions right here, when you look at the site, um, at the slides, you can click on them and you can see how to do that. Um, when you're embedding from other sources, YouTube is just copy paste and it embeds for you. You just copy the URL and it's right there. But maybe there's some other websites that you embed with, let's say Quizlet, okay? And you don't want them to exit Canvas, you want it right here. You'll get the embed code, you copy it, and you click right here on the right HTML editor, you click on it, you paste in that long code, <clears throat> and then you save it, and it, then they're not exiting Canvas, okay? So that's a, a, a page. A page has other things, like I said, insert or edit media. So you can embed some media, you can upload media and so on. And for images, you have three ways. You can copy in the URL for the image that you find online. You can upload to Canvas and you can search within Flickr. Um, it would be nice if they had more um, stock photo sites listed here. Um, it's a good idea to use alt text. Why? Does anybody know? Um, so there are some people who have visual disabilities um, and what they have is a screen reader. It's a tool that reads for them what is on the screen if they can't see well. So what it does when, it, when it's reading the words and it gets to a picture, it, whatever alt text you put there, and this is relating to accessibility, it's going to read what that picture is, you know, so they don't just skip over it. You have the option of just choosing decorative image. And then you can put in the dimensions, but what I usually do when I, when I put in a picture in a learning page or a discussion board or anything is just the same as I would do any other um, word processing or slideshow software, is I just go to the, a corner and, you know, drag and to resize it. So you can do that. A couple other things in the pages. <clears throat> this little arrow is for commons, Canvas commons. So you can go there and import something within. You don't have to exit out or anything like that. And then this is only at my school that I know of. Maybe some of you have this if you're at a community college. This little V is for lots of different apps. If you're part of a community college, I don't know if you know, but you have free space on 3C Media. So sometimes I make some videos and I don't want to put them on YouTube because, you know, maybe they have pictures of students and students said it was okay, but then I upload them to 3C Media. You can create an account there with your EDU email and you have free storage for uploading videos or documents or anything like that and some other resources. So that's what that does. It connects to these different things. And then you see this one. Um, this is really beautiful because you could record media right here. You don't have to use any external um, tool. You can record media right in a page or a discussion board. You can record it or you can um, within, or you can record and upload it, okay? So um, here, maybe I've used something on my computer and I'm just uploading, or if I click on record media, I need to give permission to my computer microphone and I can, I can make a video or audio right there, right in Canvas. So the paragraph where you see that, that's for headers. It's good practice for making um, web pages and documents accessible to use um, styles. So maybe use a heading or a title, and then, you know, if you have a lot of text, then you have um, subheadings, subtitles, and so on. And then this little 
Da Vinci guy here. If you click on that, it's going to tell you where there might be accessibility problems for you. So accessibility is a really big thing by law. Everything we create is supposed to be accessible and it's not. So we're doing the best we can, right? But OTAN does have some offerings on how to make your content accessible, not just for online teaching, but for anything, how to make it accessible. So look for that. I'm sure, I don't know about the summer, but there are workshops and online um, webinars and so on. Very useful. This is in the free version, a little bit different. In the free version, you have Microsoft Teams meeting. I've never used that. I, I hear it's kind of cool. I don't know anything about it. And then it has Google Hangouts Meet. I don't know if any of you are using that. It's like it's like Zoom. I don't know if it can do everything that Zoom does. I haven't I haven't used Google Hangouts for quite a long time, but it's something for video or web conferencing. So in the free version, that's what you have there. Your opening page. So that is the first page of your module. So module is just the retainer where you, where you put things in. And what I think is really nice is not just to jump into the first activity, but to let students know what they're going to be learning, right? So what do you want to communicate with students about regarding this topic? What preview of the content will, would be engaging to the students? How can you explain it in brief? what students will learn or will gain. It could be your agenda for the day, for the week, for the, you know, two weeks, for the unit, okay? You could include your objectives. Community colleges, we call those student learning outcomes. You could include the CASAS competencies that you're going to um, go over. ELPS probably means nothing to our students, but you could take the words from English language proficiency standards, anchor standards, you could take some of the words there, okay? Or those of you who are not ESL, you're doing CCRS, you could include some of the standards. Um, you might wanna change it to language students will understand, right? You could have your opening page be a guiding question. It could be an image, it could be a GIF. GIFs you can find on Giphy. And they're just like image files. You download them to your desktop and you upload them into Canvas. So um, I'm pretty sure everyone here knows what a GIF is, but it's just like a short, short video clip, just very short, okay? You could have a short text for them to read. So you know, when you're in your classroom teaching, you really wanna grab the students. You wanna let them know what you're gonna be teaching. You wanna get them interested, right? This is like your hook. So these probably are not very appealing. <laughs> These are what I used to do when we had, you know, computer lab time and they were doing some work outside of class. Um, I would say, these are the things you're going to do in the computer lab. And then I would have another module. This would say, these are the things you're going to do outside of class in Canvas. And what I did is I would hyperlink to the activities within Canvas as well. Well, not the greatest. I mean, um, I was learning, to be honest, I was learning. And now I know that this is not super appealing. It was fine. But now what I've done is I include imagery. And I include objectives for each week. So week one is nutrition, week two is personality. And I call these college topics because I'm at the top level of ESL. You know, the push has been going for a long time to get them to you know, transition into college or to career training. So I call it college topic, nutrition, psychology, um, humanities, uh, media studies, and I have the objectives for each week. Here's a couple more. Um, this is medical technology, and this is geography, and this is neurology. So they're learning all these big words that, that will help them feel like, oh, I'm studying college content here. Of course, if you're teaching low-level ESL, you're going to call it something else, like clothing or alphabet, right? And if you're teaching in CTE or ASE, you know, if you're teaching a history class, you're going to spell out what students are going to be able to do at the end of that module, that learning unit, um, in different terms, okay? So I think that's an important addition. I didn't always include it, but I think it's great when students are doing the majority of the work online, 50% or more, to have this spelled out to them. You know, when, when they come into your classroom, you probably have an agenda, right, on the wall. So this can act as the agenda for the learning unit. 
again, some people are much more creative. Um, this is my friend, Katrina, my colleague. She uses Buncee, and with Buncee, <clears throat> there are hyperlinks. So when students click here, they're gonna go somewhere else. And when they click here, it's gonna take them somewhere else. So I would check it out. Buncee, I haven't used it. It looks amazing. It looks like so much fun. And um, this teacher has gone crazy with it. She really loves it. As you can see, teaching a level one ESL, some of those students we know do not have literacy in their first language. If it was so much text, like those first, first opening pages I showed you, that would be a total failure on my part, right? So she uses just one word and they go to that and they, they interact with some content about learning the names for the colors, okay? And then I always like to have a final, um, a final page that says, hey, you're done, congratulations. You made it to the end of this week. This one was for week four last week. It was in the midpoint. And then I got, I had a Google form here that they click on and give me some feedback. Actually, I use Padlet where they click here because in the middle of the class, I want them to see what everybody else is writing um, so that maybe, you know, they're not always used to giving feedback to the teacher. Like, well, she's a teacher. She's supposed to know if it's good or not. So um, I use Padlet for that. And then they go and they type in what they're learning, what, what's something that they're having challenge with, what they want to practice more and so on. And um, so that could be midterm. Uh, and you could have it at the end. So you can see um, in some of my courses, I use these Pixabay um, visuals, designs throughout. And then in another class, I used a lot of Giphy's, GIF. So throughout, you know, just so that there was some unifying design. I'm not a design expert, but I think it would make it look better if, if you use the similar, similar imagery and design throughout. Okay, assignments. Okay, you're probably, I think our world is gonna be going more and more online. I think we are going to be going more and more online. K through 12 and adult, college is already, a lot of colleges, you get a degree fully online, right? So I think we're gonna be going there. So if you start using Canvas and you stay at your current job where they're offering you Canvas or you start using Canvas and you like it and you stay with it, you're gonna create so much content. I mean, in five, six years, I have so much stuff in there. Um, probably in abundance. I need to go and weed some stuff out that wasn't so good in the beginning. So what you should really do is create a naming system for your assignments. So maybe if you're teaching, let's say, uh, I better not go with biology or math because I don't even know, but let's say you're teaching ESL, okay, or you're teaching U.S. history. Um, for ESL, maybe it's grammar assignments, maybe it's writing assignments, maybe it's presentations, maybe it's projects. Have a naming system for the different types of assignments so that when you're you're going to teach a new class and you're mixing up some of your content because maybe you have some repeaters and you don't want them to do the same assignments, you'll be able to find what you're looking for easier, okay? So um, we were looking at pages. Pages is where they learn some content, okay? Assignments is where they show they've learned some content, okay? So with assignments, it could be a writing assignment, it could be a presentation, it could be any sort of assignments that you do a project, okay? So what you do with assignments, you see the same sort of interface for creating an assignment. You can set the points. You can group your assignments. That, that's probably something I should do so that um, I know these are for practicing grammar or these are writing assignments. So you can group them. You can display the grade as a percentage, complete, incomplete. I do a lot of those. Just I just wanted them to read something or you know, look at something or answer one question about a video. So a lot of times if they do it, it's complete. They don't do it, it's incomplete. You can have it displayed as points, letter grade. My students don't know what GPA is, not, not most of them. Or it's just a practice assignment, not graded. Okay, and again, going back to you can you need to decide how you want to accept the assignment, text entry, website URL, media recordings, and so on. I'm going to show you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> plagiarism review, group assignment, peer review. So you can with the group assignments, you can I'm going to show you that in a second. You can um, you can create groups or you can let students self-select. 
This is in the free version, as I mentioned, the anonymous grading. I don't have that. And then you can, you can decide who you want things to go to and so on. So you need to decide. Um, I have my students, for a long time I've been having them use Google Docs because when I ask them, the majority have a Google email. And I just really, I don't know why, I just really like the way that I can make comments on Google Docs. Google Slides, you know, it's saved online. Maybe they have the uh, web version, Office 365, or maybe they have the software, you know, in edition on their computer, MS Word or PowerPoint. Do you want them just to type something in? Do you want them to record themselves speaking or record a video? Um, do you want them to submit from some external tool? You need to decide, okay? So I have been leaving, leaving this kind of all checked at this point. Well, when I go back to the classroom, at least part of the time, um, I'm going to be a little more picky about that, okay? It's just because I'm getting, getting assignments every which way coming at me. So here's an example. One of my first assignments um, is to have students write a letter of introduction. I have some questions that I want them to answer. And this student, he was working from his phone, I believe. And so to go to Google Docs, you know, I, I gave instructions how you can get the app on your phone for free for Google. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I can't imagine typing something like this there. But um, so he typed it, he submitted by text entry. So that's not really possible very much for me to give feedback right here on his text. I could add comments. I could I could copy and paste it into a Word file and then attach it with comments. I could record my voice saying comments. And the middle one, if I have it right, this is like voice to text. <laughs> it's kind of cool. So I could say Carlos and it will start typing out my words. Then I could you know, view the rubric and give him a grade. It wasn't 30 points, by the way. But so I, I, don't, I don't think text entry is very good for a long written assignment. I don't recommend it, but if that's all the students can do, well, accept it for now, right? Some students sent me a Word file, and it's so nice because it did appear just like this. It appeared right in front of my face in Canvas. I didn't have to go anywhere else, and when you open a Word um, submitted file in um, assignments, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can put comments just like you can in Google Docs. You see the comments here. So then I didn't, this was my first time to have students submit it like this. I didn't realize that that they wouldn't be able to see my comments without a couple of steps. So they told me, I can't see your comments. Oh, great. I downloaded it. I did it all again and sent it to them when I didn't have to do that. So when the students submit something, they get this submitted. Okay. They can submit the revision. It will just say submit again. But what I didn't know, and I had to test it out by, you know, taking the role of a student in my own course, what they needed to do was go to view feedback. And then they would be able to see all the comments, okay? So I prefer Google Docs still, okay? So when they use Google Docs, they're usually pasting in the URL. When they click share, it looks like this. I can view within Canvas or I can view it in a new tab, okay? So different options. Maybe you want to explain all those to students or just let them figure it out, I don't know. Probably good to explain. Okay, so assignments, a little bit more. You can create groups. You can allow self-sign up where they, they choose who wants to be in their group. Um, you can create the number of groups and how many members per group. Three or four is, is probably the best number, right? You can automatically assign a group leader. You can set the first student to join the group as a group leader or a random student as a group leader. So this would be really good for assignments that are group projects. I don't know that I would do that right now in the, this day and age, but um, something to think about for the future. And you can require peer reviews. So when a, a student goes in and submits assignment, and then he comes back into Canvas the next time around on his to-do list may say, you need to review this student's paper and click on the link and we'll take it there to that assignment. Um, so there are different ways you can assign peer reviews. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit faster, rubrics. So when you use rubrics, I have a rubric that I use for paragraphs, was what I'm doing at my level. 
it was so easy just to copy and paste in. I don't know why I wasn't doing this before because I used to print out a paper and mark on the rubric and give the paper to the student. The student can come in here and see what they did and I can leave comments uh, as well when I'm grading. So this is when a student submits something, <clears throat> here's another view of the rubrics. When the student submits something, you're gonna get it on your to-do list when you on your homepage. And then what you do then, um, let's say that um, many students submitted, so I looked at the first one, speed grader is where you go. You go there, you see who has submitted, it will take you to the next person who submitted, and you put in the grades. You can view your rubric, the student can view the rubric, you can put comments by voice, by video, or text right here. And then this is what the rubric looks like when you're going to rate the student, you put the points here, and then save it. So nice, I like it. I'll, I'll never go back to paper rubrics now. Discussions, same layout, everything's the same here. Um, you can attach a file. Um, I wanna show you, I I've, have so many classes where um, the students really gelled well, but there's a, there's a trick to it. So it's usually some vocabulary, sometimes phrasal verbs or idioms or whatever content I want them to use. We have conversation and then they do some writing in just short sentences. So this was um, preposition combinations, okay? So I always do the first post for an example, okay? And you can put in videos and so on. And then, I mean, this discussion went on, this was like from, from a Thursday through a Sunday. The discussion kept going and going and going, but I was there. This was like the second discussion board of the um, term. So that first discussion, I was replying to everybody, but then after that, I, I slept, you know, take some steps back because it's a lot of time, okay? But, you know, you need to be present there in the beginning. So you create the text for what you want them to discuss, and all they do then is go in and click reply, post their, um, Post their answers, they can put in a video, they can put in a picture. And um, you can see that you can attach files, you can allow threaded replies, um, graded or not, you can add it to the student to-do list. If you have a huge class, you can create groups so that they're not seeing millions of posts every day. You can create groups. Um, you, different grading options, yes. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. You're at the four minute mark. I know. Okay, thank you. I see that. Okay, so that's discussions. One tip on discussions. I think it's important. Sometimes I've seen teachers have a discussion and there's only one right answer and the students can see what the other you know, people posted. So what I would recommend for discussions is either have users must post before seeing replies if it's just like one answer, that's, there's just one answer for your question or use a quiz. Okay, so I have instructions on, dis on um, creating discussions. You have to be very explicit. I have a simple rubric. And this is something I share with my students about adding images and video into Canvas discussions because it makes it, makes it nicer when you can see. Be present, post yourself at the beginning and then wean yourself off. What I've seen happen in the past is uh, a, an advanced student in my class kind of takes on the work of the moderator for me. So you could assign weekly moderators, the one who's going in and, and making sure everybody gets replied to at least once. External links are super simple, super simple. You just, you don't have to do much. You just go to your model, you click plus, you choose external URL, you put in the URL, and you put in the name. And I always have it load in a new tab. Okay, quizzes, this is what mine looks like on the left. I don't know about other community college teachers. This is what mine looks like. For the free version, quizzes are like this, and I saw it in the beginning. Some people find it's a little bit tricky. It is. That's probably the hardest thing is, and time consuming, you know, putting all the questions. So there are quizzes. You can have them graded, ungraded. Um, I like the new quiz, quizzes because there are a lot more different options for questions. So you can see the different question types that you have. When it's an essay or something like that, you have to go in, obviously, and give a score. I always give an ungraded survey at the end. As I said, the midterm, I use a Padlet or a Google form, but at the end, I always have um, a survey because I wanna know how I'm doing. What students don't know, I tell them it's anonymous, but you can see who has written what, okay? There's no anonymous surveys that I have found yet. 
And then once you have all your pages and assignments, you go to your modules, you click on plus, you find what you want to add, and you add them in the order that you want. To change the order is really simple. You can just you can just click and drag, or you can go to these three and you can move. You, and then you'll see where you want to move them. So we don't have time to look at my learning unit. Okay. If you would like to look at it, please email me and I would be happy to either meet with you or send you some information. Um, but some other useful tools, I'll just finish, announcements. That's probably the best way to send information to students unless you're doing texting um, because it will go to whatever email they used in setting up their account. For those of community colleges, it's, it's um, already chosen for them usually, right? Um, so I always, the week before class starts, I send a to-do list and I have a welcome video. If the students can see you and hear you before they even come to your class, they will love you once they get there. Um, I have them fill out a questionnaire so I can learn a little bit about them. I give them the syllabus. And then I also tell them all the different ways they can access Canvas through an announcement. Um, some other useful tools are the notifications. So you might want to show students that it shows how they're going to get Canvas feeds, like when someone posts a discussion um, or someone posts a reply, how they're going to get the new assignments coming, they can choose this. If they don't want it coming everywhere, they can um, choose. Um, finally, comments. There's a lot of great content there. So once you get to your course, you choose comments, you type in what you're looking for, and you're going to see a lot of great content to import. Name Coach is not on the free version, but you can record the pronunciation of your name, and so can students. There's a there's an e-portfolio. I don't recommend. Instead, I like any of these. Okay, the the e-portfolio. It would be nice because it follows the student from um, course to course within your agency, but it's it's not very fun. It's it's kind of not user friendly. Other useful to tools you may have or you may not, if free version no, is Studio, and that's for creating videos or screencasts as well. Um, screencasting, there's a lot you could do with that. I recommend if you make your own videos to include a note taking handout if you can. Because, uh, you know, some students learn just by listening and watching a video, but if they write it down, the chances of remembering better. Flipgrid, if you don't have studio, Flipgrid is awesome, I recommend. And here's a new one. There are some activities that I do in my classroom that I am unable to replicate online. I just, I can't do it like, like the um, four corners and matching sentence strips. This is a site word wall. It's awesome, check it out. Padlet works really well for four corners or for getting feedback. And Quizlet, we all know and love. Um, it used to be integrated with Canvas, now it's not. Um, but you can embed from Quizlet. There are many, many tools when you go to settings and apps. Oh my gosh, there are so many different apps that you could use. Um, you probably heard of awesome stories if you teach English. Atomic Learning, lots of different good sites or apps. Um, ways that you can check in on the students. You can go to um, a module. And you can go view progress and you can see what if they've done that module you can go to people you can see how many hours they've spent online and you get some analytics like this like their grade how much they've been participating they haven't been going looking at all the views very much and so um, that's very useful for giving you know end of term information so i have some tips it's out of time but um you i really recommend you look over these tips i will do a tech talk um, on May 8th about um, tips for having successful experiences for students online. Final word of advice. Remember, the teacher-student and student-student relationships will always remain one of the most important technologies available in your classrooms. So just putting some content online, the students are engaged, you need to interact with them and you need to give them opportunities to interact with each other in Canvas. More information where you can learn more, questions, resources. Thank you for joining me.